Hey folks, it's Beth Wright again, and I am providing you a podcast on Chapter 52. We're going to be talking about seizure disorders and spasticity. Um, So I do have notes for you that are available for you to follow along as we go through the podcast. So first off, these are your exemplars for this chapter. So we have the anti-seizure medication classifications, and then we have phenobarbital, the benzodiazepines, gabapentin, phenytoin, um, harbavazepine, valproic acid, the lamotrigine, levotyrazotam, and topiramate. Okay, so I know those are mouthfuls to say. They are for me as well. Um, I've got a pronounce medication link so that you can type in medications and learn to say them because it tends to help learn them as well. Also, um, sometimes you'll see the trade name, but as we know now, NCLEX only provides generic names, so really that's the way you you need to learn them. And believe me, that's hard after years of knowing the trade name. Um, it's hard for me too. So anyway, we'll just take it for what it is and do our best with learning that. Okay, so let's talk about seizure disorders. Um, seizures are never a good thing when someone has it, but basically it's a brief episode of abnormal electrical activity in the brain's nerve cells. Now, just like the heart, the brain is an electric organ. You know, it has a lot of electricity going on there. And, uh, you know, when that electricity uh, is disruptive, disrupted in some way then a person is uh, capable of having seizures so we may see seizures as a single event such as you know uh, children uh, sometimes will have uh, febrile or fev- high fevers uh, that cause them to have seizures uh, you could see an adverse effect of medications causing a seizure I've seen that before with individuals or you may have a uh, chronic recurrent patterns of seizures and that's known as epilepsy. Um, A person can also have a convulsion and that's where they have tonic-clonic types of seizures um, characterized by spasmodic contractions of the involuntary muscles. So when we talk about tonic-clonic type of seizures, let's, let's talk about that. We have, um, with tonic, the tonic phase is where there's a sustained contraction of those muscles. And you'll see an abnormal posture of the patient. And they will have an absence of respirations. And they can become cyanotic in that state. So it's like they're frozen in a state of muscle contraction. Uh, The clonic phase is where they uh, have rapid rhythmic and systemic or uh, symmetrical jerking movement of the body and so when we see this you know we definitely for both of those uh, we're definitely concerned with safety Uh, with a person you know when there's a lot of jerking movement going on they can hit something uh, you know so we always want to be concerned about safety there. Um, So tonic-clonic is a major motor seizure and sometimes patients will talk about and you'll read about an aura, A-U-R-A, and what that is is you know the patient will have some kind of sensation and it can be a visual, it can be a uh, some type of a smell or a taste, it could be each aura is different for every patient that I've ever heard patients talk about so they will get a sensation and know that a seizure is coming on by that aura Um, so with seizures as it's going on we got to think about safety Um, we got to think about airway and and those kinds of things 
So here's a pictogram just showing you that tonic where those muscles are in that sustained contraction there. Um, there's stiffness there and their postures all out of whack. And then the clonic is where they're, you know, having movement of the body parts. You also see in this slide some other signs and symptoms um, and things that we want to know about the seizure. You know, what was, you know, the onset, again, asking about an aura, um, what body parts are affected, what was their level of consciousness, did they lose consciousness or was it reduced, um, what's their muscle tone, the pupils, any cyanosis, altered salivation, and incontinence is something that you will see happen with seizures as well. And of course it's got our interventions here, LA definitely has to be first when we look at our ABCs, we got to protect that patient from harm, uh, we don't restrain them. Uh, but we do, you know, make sure the bed's in the lowest position, remove any kind of objects like an overbed table or anything like that. Do not place anything inside of the mouth. There used to be a tongue block, uh, but they no longer recommend that. So that is not used at all because of more injury to the patient. And then, of course, observing and recording the events as it happens. So that can help with diagnosing. So when we talk about ep epilepsy, um, usually requires a long-term therapy, meaning uh, lifelong therapy most of the time. And it can be, you know, a sudden event uh, or, you know, definitely an abnormal event as a firing of those neurons. So the electrical system of the brain is just all to pieces. Um, diagnosed by clinical signs and symptoms. So again, thinking about those symptoms uh, of what we see with a patient, the tonic, the clonic, um, and you know, what's their respirations, what's their level of consciousness, those kinds of things are the signs and symptoms we want to look for. Um, and they will also do um, an EEG, electroencephalogram, uh, to help diagnose this and that what that is is it measures and records the ac electrical activity of the brain uh, and so I put you a picture there of an EEG they put the electrodes on the brain I mean on the brain on the head uh, and then they measure that and you'll see something that kind of looks like an EKG um, with a lot of waves on it and that kind of thing and they're looking for the normal pattern of electrical activity um, versus abnormal brainwave activity on that EEG. Um, also EEGs you'll see that used to determine brain death as well. Um, the other day I heard about a patient that was on continuous EEG. I had not heard of that before, uh, but they were evaluating him for seizure activity. Um, and so they had him on it just like a continuous ECG, electrocardiogram, like a telemetry. Uh, they are now doing an, a, a continuous EEG. So the classifications with epilepsy, we have the idiopathic type, um, and that's usually due to a secondary cause, uh, such as some kind of a developmental defect, a metabolic issue, birth injury, fevers, or an acquired neurological disorder, or alcohol or other drug effects. Partial seizures uh, begin in a specific area of the brain, and it can it's a localized uh, brain lesion, uh, which, you know, when you think about a lesion on those, uh, in the brain somewhere, what that's going to do is block or disturb the normal electrical conduction that happens in the brain. And so, therefore, it's, you know, disrupting that and it can lead to a seizure and it can be caused by different things brain injury trauma stroke or tumor um, and so you know I have a friend that was recently diagnosed with seizures and she was in a very bad accident some 20 30 years ago 
Uh, that's the only thing they can contribute her seizures to. Um, she has partial seizures. Um, and it was just, just like two years ago, a, an onset of these seizures started happening. She'd never had them before. Uh, and so they determined that it was from the traumatic accident that she had uh, years ago uh, that finally led to a big enough lesion that disrupted that electrical activity. Also, tumors in the brain obviously can cause problems like that as well. Symptoms can range from simple motor or sensory uh, effects to more complex abnormal movements or bizarre behavior. Um, and you can see movements as automatic, repetitive, uh, and inappropriate to the situation. And, you know, chewing, swallowing, uh, aversion movements would be m movements that are not wanted. Simple partial seizures, uh, consciousness is not, consciousness is not impaired, but uh, complex partial seizures, the level of consciousness is decreased. And then we have generalized seizures, and uh, those can be bilateral, symmetric, and definitely no discernible point of origin in the brain for these uh, types of seizures. And the most common type is your tonic-clonic type of seizure. We also can have an absence seizure where there's alterations in the uh, level of consciousness, but it only lasts for a few seconds. Uh, the myoclonic uh, seizures are where there's a contraction of muscles or groups of muscles, and akinetic is where there's an absence of movement. Now remember, guys, you are not going to be diagnosing. That's not our job. Our job is to recognize and then treat. Uh, so don't worry so much about necessarily what, you know, how to diagnose, okay? We know how to diagnose EEG is one way of watching the signs and symptoms, but it's not our job to diagnose the type, but we are going to pay attention to those signs and symptoms like level of consciousness and things like that, and that will help in the diagnosing of seizures. Status elept elepticus is uh, an emergency type of seizure. It's a life-threatening event and they're going to have tonic-clonic convulsions here that last several minutes uh, and so airway and breathing is uh, an issue. Hypotension, hypoxia, and cardiac dysrhythmias are definitely of concern and unless there's prompt treatment um, this can result in permanent brain damage and death. And the causes of that um, status elepticus is because of a lot of times people stopping their AED as uh, anti-epileptic epileptic drugs. Uh, so a lot of times people stopping that are, are messing with their dosage. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, I had a student one time that was a, a, um, an epileptic, and which is fine. We have that. Uh, quite often. But anyway, because of the side effects of the medicines, uh, she was sedating her and she couldn't study as much as she wanted to or retain the information. And so she started messing with her uh, medicine dosages. And we were in clinicals and I heard this really loud scream. And then I heard a thump on the floor. And everybody starts running, and it was my student, and she had a big seizure there right in between the patient rooms in the hallway, um, and kind of found out it was because she had been trying to reduce her medications because of it causing the side effects that it does. Uh, brain trauma or, tumor, or tumors can cause status elepticus. Uh, systemic or CNS infections, al alcohol withdrawal or drug overdoses can also cause this. All right, so generalized characteristics of the drugs that treat seizures. Um, it's the purpose, of course, is to control seizure activity. Um, it 
typically does not cure this. It just manages those seizures or, or you know, the disorder. Um, and the problems with this is that uh, difficulties as, as far as this is that uh, it may take trials of different drugs to get a handle on it. Uh, it also can, you know, be one or maybe a combination of drugs. And there may be the issue of titrating the drugs. And of course, we want to take the lowest form of uh, lowest dose of medications uh, because of side effects. So, you know, finding that middle of the road that will control the symptoms can sometimes be really difficult for patients. Uh, and they need a lot of support during this time. Um, so thinking about all of that uh, can, you know, uh, cause the patient and, you know, we just have to tell them and be supportive and coach them through this that, you know, we, we will get there. Just we got to be patient with this. Um, a lack of seizure control during the drug uh, drug selection and titration is very difficult. Um, the uh, social stigma of being an epileptic is um, sometimes problemsome for patients. The other part of this is patients can't drive uh, until they are six months free of a seizure. So imagine your driving ability being taken away. You have to ask anyone to to, you know, someone to take you anywhere. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot to, that goes along with this. Um, adverse effects of the medications are oftentimes a reason why um, we have poor compliance with the medications. And, of course, any undesirable drug interactions can also be a problem. Duration and discontinuing of drugs, uh, drug therapy for this may be discontinued after a seizure-free period of at least two years, uh, but most of the time you'll see people are on this lifelong. Um, rec it's recommended that we only discontinue or change drugs or doses one medication at a time so that we know what works. It's got to be done gradually over a two to three-month period and under close supervision due to that uh, potential uh, status elepticus that can happen. Okay, so let's talk about the drugs specifically. Phenobarbital is one of your oldest drugs that's been around um, that uh, helps control uh, seizures. Don't see it used a whole lot these days, but it's still in our books, so we're going to cover it. It depresses, and all of these medicines are CNS depressants. Um, it depresses the CNS uh, by messing with that conduction of impulses. Um, phenobarbital is a barbiturate, okay? And a barbiturate is uh, known as a CNS depressant. So you may have studied that in psych. Um, it's used as a sedative and an anti-eleptic agent in the treatment of generalized tonic-clonic and partial seizures. And you can have the perennial form uh, used to treat acute seizures, although your first line of treatment for that is going to be uh, benzodiazepines and dilantin. Adverse effects of this, again, are your central uh, nervous system depressants. Um, and so, you know, if you have a person who is already taking uh, any kind of CNS depressant, and then we add on top of it another CNS depressant, what do we got to watch for? Major sedation here. Uh, breathing uh, is going to be an issue as well. So we've got to be very careful with that. Uh, you see somnolence, uh, agitation possibly, confusion, vertigo, and nightmares with this medicine as some of the adverse effects. The Steven Johnson syndrome, I put a picture there for you just to see uh, how bad that can be. It is a serious drug uh, or uh, skin and mucosa 
reaction typically to medication. So anytime I've ever seen Stephen Johnson, it's always been a reaction to a medicine, although it can be a reaction to an infection as well. It's very serious. I've seen people die from it. Um, and so we've got to be watching, uh, monitoring the skin when we're uh, dealing with this medication. Um, also, there's a black box warning with this medication and it's about uh, suicidal ideation and so what must be assessed when that is a potential adverse effect of a medicine we've got to be asking patients watching for depression asking them about you know uh, do they have any kind of plans to hurt themselves and looking at you know suicide precautions uh, possibly if that is the case so we definitely want to be paying attention to that. The administration of this medication, it can be given IV, uh, and there are several incompatibilities with the IV route, so we've got to check for that. Uh, we want to, if we're giving it IV, we want to give it in a large vein, uh, and if you, and it, the infusion rate is no faster than 60 milligrams per minute. Um, any kind of inadvertent intra-arterial injection could cause spasms of the arteries and gangrene. So we've got to be sure we're in the right place, in the vein. Um, it can be also given IM, and so for that, it's you have to use a large needle and inject into deep into the muscle. So uh, assessing for those adverse effects, we want to be sure we don't have any kind of respiration problems, uh, hypoventilation, apnea, respiratory depression, also laryngospasms or bronchial spasms, and a circulatory collapse, especially if we're given an IV. We want to always provide teaching for the patient. Uh, and if you'll note on page 955 in your textbook, there's teaching for each, actually this particular drug, but each one of the drugs will have a separate teaching for them. So you need to be sure to look at that. And then, of course, we want to assess for therapeutic effects. Um, so how will we know this is working? Um, the patient's going to be absent those seizure activities. So what kinds of things will we will we want to see with the patient? Uh, to make sure that the drug is actually working. Now, our benzodiazepines are used as antidepressants, anti-epileptics, or skeletal muscle relaxants. This is your main drug that you get on board for the status elepticus um, and recurrent convulsive seizures. Um, it's contraindicated with your acute narrow angle glaucoma, anybody in shock or coma, anybody with acute alcohol intoxication and pregnancy. The other thing about this drug is it is, has a very long half-life in newborns and in the elderly, around 20 to 80 hours. That is a long time for a drug to be in the body. So for any elderly person or newborn that's getting this medication, what will need to be done? If we have a half-life that, like, half that long, we're going to have to get a lower dosage for them. Um, for that status lepticus, it's going to be given IV. We give it slow, and we also administer O2, and we put the patient on bed rest um, due to potential falls there. And it's also given in a large vein. So our adverse effects, we know that the central nervous system is going to be affected with depression, disorientation, restlessness, confusion. Um, in the first two weeks of treatment with benzodiazepines, they can actually have a paradoxical excitatory or a, a, an opposite reaction. Instead of sedation, they're going to be hyper. Um, most serious side effects is your cardiovascular effects. Um, they can have bradycardia with cardiovascular collapse uh, and hypotension. They can also have life-threatening tachycardia. 
Um, also, they can have other signs and symptoms like constipation, diarrhea, incontinence, urinary retention, and a change in the libido. Of course, we want to teach, always teach. So, you know, when something with the CNS depressant, we know we're, you know, we got to teach the patient about avoiding alcohol or any other CNS depressant that's not prescribed. Uh, we got to teach about driving or the lack of or not doing driving or heavy machinery operating, that kind of thing. Um, so be sure to look at page 957 for this. Um, and then we're going to evaluate the therapeutic uh, effects of the medication and also for adverse effects. The gabapentin is your next medication. Now this medicine uh, is used for partial seizures, but it also is used for neuropathic pain as well. Um, and that's the most of the time when you see gabapentin, that's what you're going to see it for is Neurontin uh, is your trade name. I've left it on there, but gabapentin uh, you'll see for like diabetic neuropathy or folks with back issues that where the nerves are are affected uh, a lot of times they'll be on the gabapentin for that neuropathic pain um, renal and liver impaired you must check the labs it talks about this in your textbook uh, so we got to review that um, for the labs to make sure you know first off where they're at a baseline before getting started and then thereafter after they're on the medicine. Um, adverse effects is CNS depressant so you know we know we're going to have those uh, kinds of problems with depression um, as well as dizziness um, and insomnia for this and ataxia. Um, other side effects with this are pruritus, dry mouth, dyspepsia, which is heartburn, nausea, vomiting, and suicide ideation. Um, the teaching for this, as we always want to do, is on page 959, uh, so be sure to look at that. And uh, we always want to evaluate for therapeutic effects and for our adverse effects. And I put you a picture gram on here uh, about Neurontin or Gabapentin. Uh, the other signs and symptoms that this brings out is slurred speech, drowsiness, lethargy, and diarrhea. Um, so you can take a look at that. Theotoin is our oldest and most widely used anti-epileptic uh, drug. Um, and you know it can uh, work it works by delaying the influx of sodium ions into the neurons and stops or prevents that excitability from happening um, it's used to control tonic clonic seizures uh, and other you know non-epileptic type of seizures as well um, now once a dose in certain formulation has found is found with Dilantin or the Fiatoin, the patient should stick with that. And so we need to work with the pharmacist to make sure, and the doctor to make sure that uh, happens. Uh, generic drugs can be off as much as 18% from the trade drug. So it can be crucial in these types of patients if they get too little or too much of the medication. So we got to be careful to watch about that. The other thing about this drug is is um, highly bound to plasma protein. Uh, so if we have a patient that is not eating well or maybe has a liver disorder and they've got low levels of albumin, um, then we may have a problem with toxicity um, because what will happen is the drug will not have about albumin to bind to for distribution to where it needs to go to and therefore it'll elevate in the blood level and so they can be become toxic uh, for that and the other part of that is it won't control the seizures as well so here are your adverse effects for this uh, one of your big ones, the uh, nausea, vomiting, of course, all the, that's, you see that in a whole lot of medicines. 
But some that you may not have heard of before is the Jejunva hyperplasia, which is a gum disease. So, you know, it's recommended that they see the dentist and uh, be sure to keep follow-up appointments with the dentist. Uh, the risk of osteoporosis, so what that is, is where there's a weakening of the bones. Uh, and so when we have weak bones, we are at risk for falls and at risk for fractures. And so these folks should be um, monitored for that and also placed on fall precautions uh, if it is indicated. And bone marrow depression also, so there we want to watch for, you know, uh, issues with infection, issues with bleeding. Uh, so we got to, you know, for infection, we want to pay attention to sore throats. We also want to check the lab work on these patients looking for red blood cells, white blood cells. With administration, it must be given with normal sal saline. Uh, IV and so a lot of times what you'll see with patients is uh, especially that status elepticus uh, they'll give uh, benzodiazepine first and then may start them on uh, an IV of Fiatoin um, especially after monitoring the lab work to see what the drug level is. There are multiple incompatibilities with uh, Fiatoin, so got to watch about those and make sure we're not causing a drug-drug interaction. Teaching is on page 961 for this medication, so you need to be sure to look at that. Uh, and then, of course, evaluate for effectiveness and uh, for those adverse effects. Uh, we can also have that issue with Steven Johnson with this, so we want to monitor that skin um, with that with this type of thing as well. Okay, and now we have our carbamazepine, and here with this one we have a black box warning as well. So you always want to pay pay attention to black box warnings. A granulocytosis is one, and that's where we have a decrease in our white blood cells. Aplastic anemia is when the bone marrow stops making new cells. So very serious, uh, you know, and we all of our red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets can all be out of whack with a, aplastic anemia. Uh, other adverse effects that we can see with this, this medication includes the heart block. Again, that Steven Johnson syndrome, respiratory depression, hepatitis. Uh, massive hepatic cellular necrosis and suicide ideation. So a lot of these have the same similar adverse effects to them. Uh, contraindications for this are MAOIs and so they have to be stopped 14 days before beginning this particular medication. We need to use this with uh, caution on renal and liver impaired so we need to know what those labs are and of course teaching uh, we need to look at that on page 962 for this particular drug uh, and always evaluate for effectiveness and for those adverse effects. Here is a picture gram again with regards to this medication. It adds a few other adverse effects, blurred vision, double vision, uh, nystagmus, vertigo. Uh, it also says not to give with grapefruit juice because that can mess with the uh, metabolizing of the drug. Valporic acid is highly bound to protein. Um, so that means, again, uh, someone with a low albumin level or not eating good, that kind of thing, we can have problems with this drug. We have black box warnings with this medication, pancreatitis being one. So, you know, we need to know those signs and symptoms. Um, neural tube disorders if taken during pregnancy. So definitely we need to teach the patient to use 
forms of birth control uh, for women of childbearing age. Uh, and if there's any suspect of uh, pregnancy, we need to check that. And also bleeding. So the black box warnings, we got to, uh, you know, pay attention to those. We want to, for the bleeding, we want to look for any kind of bruising, um, any kind of occult blood, like in a stool, that kind of thing. Uh, and they should have lab work with the platelet count, the bleeding times, clotting times, that kind of thing. Um, also, we need to watch about liver function with this medicine as well. For administration, um, the IV route of this medication should only be used for 14 days. And then it has to be switched to a PO do dose. Of course, we want to teach. The patient and that is on page 967 and uh, always evaluate for therapeutic and adverse effects. Lamotrigine is your next oh I'm sorry this is uh, just a picture of picture gram of all three of those medicines we just talked about uh, and just giving you additional information about them. Lamotrigine is another type of medication for seizures. Again, a black box warning, Stephen Johnson's or uh, epidermal necrosis. Uh, it can't be given to children younger than 16, uh, and it should be stopped at first sign of a rash. And our uh, adverse effects or adverse um, ADs, um, dizziness, drowsiness, double vision, nausea, vomiting, and weakness. Um, to discontinue the drug, we've got to taper off. We just don't stop it. And again, we're going to do our teaching with this. The teaching for that medicine is on page 970. Um, and also uh, assess for um, adverse effects and also um, evaluate for therapeutic effects. All right, uh, levotyrazotam is your next medicine and it's used a lot of times with other anti-epileptic drugs and the therapeutic levels after two days usually is established uh, with a uh, twice a day administration. Um, Got to reduce the dose if there's renal dysfunction. So again, we've got to know those labs, the BUN, creatinine, uh, your glomerular filtrate rate. Um, it is This medicine is actually useful for people with liver dysfunction because it's not uh, broken down there or metabolized there. Um, and you can see your adverse effects. Again, we got red and white blood cell counts. Uh, double vision issues, amnesia, lots of different issues there. And suicide ideation is also listed with this um, medication. So we got to teach about that and we got to assess for that. And, um, you know, with your ocular changes, uh, we got to you know, recommend a eye exam for the patient, that kind of thing. Teaching for this is on page 970, so be sure to take a look at that. Topiramate is your last drug. It is eliminated basically unchanged through the kidney, so any kind of renal impairment, uh, dose adjustments need to be done. Uh, your adverse effects, um, ataxia, drowsiness, dizziness, um, somnolence, uh, nystagmus as well as other GI issues um, and it can also cause an increase in intraocular pressure so we would again need to um, recommend that the client gets an eye exam uh, to make sure this is not happening. Uh, we also may see weight loss and fatigue with this so again teaching with this uh, it's page 972 and we want to evaluate for effectiveness, that kind of thing. 
Okay, so when patients are placed on anti-epileptic drug therapy, we've got to do periodic measurement of drug serum levels. Uh, you know, we don't do that on all drugs. It's it's only specific uh, for certain drugs. I mean, you can do a serum drug level on any drug, but it is crucial when we're talking about uh, drugs that control seizure activity for that patient to be on the money, you know, on on spot for uh, having a therapeutic drug level. So we want to have periodic drug levels drawn uh, and document the dosages and seizure controls. It also can be recommended that they keep a diary of any kind of seizures uh, and, you know, also with including like the aura, the onset of it, that kind of thing that can help with treatment and doses dosing of medications. We've got to assess the reasons for therapeutic failures. You know, uh, what's what's the cause of it? Is it the side effects? Is it the, you know, the cost maybe? Uh, are we having issues with drug malabsorption? Um, and we've got to guide the patient through that dosage adjustment and the titrating that goes on. And again, be, our, be the coach there. Uh, and assess for possible drug-related adverse effects. Causes of drug failure can be non-compliance, uh, incorrect diagnosing or uh, medications for seizure types, too frequent change or premature withdrawal of medications, um, too much medication or the use of other drugs, alcohol re or recreational drugs, and of course our electrolyte imbalances can cause problems too. All right, this concludes your uh, podcast for this unit.